there's a missing person here, and that's, we, it's like Paul Giamatti's right here. <laughs> Elijah. Yeah, Elijah. He's making it, he's making, he's gonna be, he'll be here tonight, but he couldn't be here today. I thought I said, like, woman only. I know. Day. I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. <laughs> I also want to thank Netflix for working with us on the premiere of the film here at the Film Festival. So it was really great to share the movie with you and to have you all here um, this morning and tonight. Yeah, we're so excited. So I'm going to ask maybe just a couple of questions and then we can open it up to everyone in the audience. Uh, I did we watch the movie because I wanted to get all the laughter and all the sadness again. And it's, it's really beautiful written and beautifully director, but it seems very personal too, so is that something that you feel comfortable to talk about? Talk about the personal part? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, it is, uh, I mean, the core of it is based on a personal experience, which was my husband, is my husband here? He was here, he's, well anyway, he'll find, where is there he? he? No, where is your, oh, there he is. I saw my him. husband can attest to the fact that there is a, a core of um, uh, personal experience, which is, my husband and I had our own fertility um, journey, and uh, not exactly like this, but yeah, we went through a version of this. In real life, we have an eight-year-old, so that's great. <laughs> but um, is a movie dedicated to her? Yes, okay. it is. It says for Mia at the very end, and that's our daughter. Um, but it's not exactly her her exact tale. But I was very interested in the story for lots of reasons. Um, I was interested in writing about marriage um, and a kind of mutual midlife crisis thing. And I don't think I was originally thinking that this was material when I was in the throes of our own crisis. Um, but as time went on, I saw that actually many people I knew were having their own fertility sagas around me. It was like an epidemic among my group of friends. and. Uh, it just started speaking to me, and then I thought I was, you know, I was interested in writing about it. And, you know, although the core of it is like the emotional truth of it is something that I know inside and out, once you start writing, the narrative demands of fiction start taking over, and then people crop up, like Sadie and Molly. Um, so inventions and fiction, and so it just becomes this third thing, not necessarily a memoir but something I certainly understand pretty well. Well, also, I mean, I really love your previous film, and it was quite a long time since uh, Savage, so I was hoping you would make something else, and I really liked the film, so thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, at what point did you bring uh, all this amazing woman into the, into the film so that they can also participate in two? What they I'm so they lucky. The, the scripts and how much we wanted to do it, and what we did. Yeah. Well, I'm very lucky to have these three amazing women here. And um, she was first, Molly Kaylee. That's the order of how they appear. Are we okay with the order in which we were picked? <laughs> no, it just happened that way. Well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, well, I mean, you can talk about the story about, I mean, she, Catherine um, flew herself, to read the script on her own and flew herself to New York, and that is how I met her. She was, I was introduced to her as an idea from, I have a fantastic casting director, and um, she, Jeannie, Jeannie McCarthy. McCarthy, and Jeannie, the first thing that Jeannie said when we sat down to talk about who would play the part, she sat down and she said, well, I mean, Catherine Hahn's perfect for this. Um, and I wasn't that familiar with Catherine's stuff. I, like it was like three years ago or something, and um, then I did a Catherine Hahn film festival <laughs> and saw everything and thought, yeah, Jeannie McCarthy's right, and then we met, and uh, voila. I mean, I did fly. I flew my myself for basically for for dinner, like an early dinner. Like I I got on a plane. I met her in, on the Lower East Side. We went to her like local. Italian joint. It's not my local Italian joint. It's super fancy. It's super fancy. I was like, this is she fancy. Made you, she made you pay for your dinner too? No, I think we split. No, we split. <laughs> uh, no, I paid for it. You flew on a plane. Oh, you're right. I did fly on a plane. We split a bottle of rosé. <laughs> it's just like a local watering spot called El Pugo. <laughs> it was called El Pugo. It was very nice. It was very nice. It's to be, you know, classy. We, we split a bottle of rosé. Wine was spilled. Definitely a glass of wine was spilled. It was very, it was a little bit, we just kind of sniffed each other out. We didn't even really talk about the script. 
Um, I got to, I had to do some ADR for another project, so we went up to her um, office, I remember, and then I, all the mood boards for this were kind of up in her office. So as I was doing ADR for this other project, I tried to kind of put my scent up in this office. I remember I kind of tried to leave my juju around her office. I just was just saying secret little prayers, like, please, please. I tried to kind of leave my, my scent, and then she put me in a cab and sent me back to LA. And, I just said little prayers, and I'm so, so eternally grateful. I, I just love this piece of writing so, so profoundly. The scent worked. So yeah, my scent. <laughs> Ude Han. <laughs> did, did, did you two use the scent? <laughs> well, no, these are different. They're all really different stories. Yeah. Um, the Kaylee story is that we had an actress three weeks before the movie was about to shoot that dropped out. and. It was very scary. And once again, Jeannie McCarthy, the casting director, went on a mad hunt and she saw like 80 or 90 women in their 20s um, in, over a very brief period of time. And there were wonderful actresses, but no one really was clicking. Um, and it was very scary. Like we were really about to go. I mean, we, it was no joke. I mean, Paul and, to get Paul and Catherine and Molly and everyone's schedule coordinated, and then suddenly to have someone, a significant part drop out is really scary. And um, anyway, I had said to Jeannie McCarthy, who's the casting director, I said, isn't there a great young theater girl under a rock somewhere? I mean, this is New York. There's gotta be some girl doing theater in a basement somewhere. Hello. <laughs> That was yeah. my cue. Well, I had just finished doing a play in London and I had flown back and I was still pretty jet lagged, but also, you know, they were immediately like, on to the next thing, here's a bunch of scripts. And most of them that I read, I was, I was pretty, um, you know, unhappy with. I wasn't feeling like I was gonna find anything creatively fulfilling in that stack of work. And then they said, here's this script, read it, thought, this is filming in two and a half weeks. I don't know how every person in this city d hasn't been fighting for it. Turns out they were, uh, and rightfully so. It's a beautiful piece of writing, and one of the best parts for someone my age that I've seen, period. Um, I feel very fortunate that they they spoke my name into her ear. Uh, and I too met with her in her office. We talked for a very long time. I'm not even sure we talked about the movie a ton. We just talked about everything else. We were snipping each other out. <laughs> yeah. And we were I, in the scent of Catherine. I each laid other mine out. on very top of Catherine's. Well, because all those mood boards that were up had the pictures of of the entire cast already, and then there was like this one hole. Person. <laughs> yeah, there's just this hole in the middle of it, and I thought, oh no, this is, I'll, I'll peak if I do this project. I'll peak too soon. And I still sort of feel that way. It's a really big blessing that I didn't see coming. Okay, now I'm gonna give you the Molly Shannon story, which is kind of interesting, because she's the only, she's the, she's the only person that I ever thought could play the part. The first thing, a friend of mine read the script, a filmmaker friend, and um, she said, oh my God, that character, she's such a bitch. <laughs> and I got really scared that it was this one dimensional character, Cynthia was just a, she said it in a loving way, my friend, like, oh, she's like a fun bitch. And I got really worried that she was this like weird flat cartoon bitch. Um, and I saw Molly, I had met Molly once, very briefly, and um, I saw her in that movie, Other People, and which is a, a, a film that she made last year or the year before. Now I can't remember exactly when it was. We're, um, it's, and it's a dramatic role. She plays a mom with cancer. She was so astonishing in it. Not that the, that performance had anything to do with this movie at all, but I just couldn't believe the breath of Molly. And I just got really like, it was this hit in my brain, like she's the one, she's the one. And so the sort of, the, the short story is that we, you know, talk, I, my producers, I was like, I'm so excited, I think Molly Shannon would be perfect. Um, 
and we submitted it to her agents and they kept saying that it's not gonna work because she had scheduling conflicts and it was a small part and she's doing, moved on to bigger and better things. Um, it was really hard, it was really hard to get and we kept sort of banging our head against the wall and nobody was like getting her the script. So the, our mutual friend who's a great filmmaker, Sofia Coppola is where I met her. Um, that one fateful evening for five seconds when she was wearing overalls in Sophia's living room, I remember vividly being really excited about it. Um, I wrote to Sophia and I said, um, will you ask Molly Shannon if I can email with her? And then Molly Shannon apparently wrote to Sophia and said yes. Then I wrote to Molly Shannon and said, oh my God, hi, I have this script. It's not the lead, but it's a really good part and I think you'd be really good at it, and I rambled and rambled and rambled, and I said, would you even like consider it? We've been trying to get it to you, blah, 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 blah. Then two seconds later, yep. <laughs> yes, I will do the movie. I said, she I said, said, I will do, do it. the movie. I, didn't, I hadn't even read the script, but I was like, are you kidding? Tamara Jenkins, Katherine Hahn, at the time you were not signed on for it. But I, I said, 100% I'm gonna do it and it's gonna work. She's and she said, I'm gonna do it, I haven't read it, but I'm gonna do it. And I was like, this is the opposite of what's been happening, with banging on our door at the agency. And saying, my agent had not sent me the script, so, and then when I read it, I was like, this is like one of the best scripts I've ever read. This is, this is so beautiful. And um, so, yeah, there was some scheduling stuff with because I was shooting divorce at the same time. So as soon as we worked that out, it all worked out. Yeah. But yeah, isn't that funny that the agents sometimes, we don't I think even... that they just felt like it was too much of a cluster uh -huh. schedule nightmare. And I don't know, they were keeping us apart. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Do you need to change seats? Yeah, I do. I have to sit on Molly's yeah. lap. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that I get to play the part where I'm like a smart lady in my blue pajamas, reading the New York Times with glasses. I've never played that kind of part. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one last question, then we can open it up. So obviously it's a very um, New York movie, and I think the location also is, plays a very important part in the film. It's also very personal. I understand you leave and go and wine in the very fancy Italian places you know, on the side. Well, not everybody's invited, I'm just Catherine. But, so, so can you talk specifically about like the location and shooting in New York? You know, because yeah. it, well, they usually get it wrong. And well, that is makes, right. well, when a New Yorker tells you that you got New York right, it's very exciting because even New York filmmakers that shoot in New York, you look at the movie and it is so unfamiliar, it doesn't feel like the city at all. Um, so it was very important to me that it felt New Yorkish, and I just felt like these were creatures that, you know, grew out of the soil of the East Village, and it had to be right. Um, in fact, we, we had the movie at a different studio prior to being at Netflix, and when it was there, um, the budget that they were giving us were, was preventing us from shooting in New York. We would have had to shoot in Montreal. Montreal as the East Village. <laughs> I was like, this is gonna be bad. This is not a good, this is not good. I love Yeah, I know, but like, Paul would be speaking in Quebec, but like, what would happen? It wouldn't be the same. So I don't know, they were like, well, you can do a day of exteriors, and I said, it's not a Seinfeld episode. I'm not doing that. Bam, bam. When you see the outside of the apartment building, then you go in and you're in Los Angeles in the studio. Or whatever that, that sound is. And I, and I don't know Seinfeld, but you know what I mean. Um, so, uh, it was super important to me, and then even if you are in New York, getting New York right, and the socioeconomic specificity of this, this place, this rent-stabilized apartment in the East Village, getting that right was, you know, essential. I had a great production designer and um, a great cinematographer who's here, and, um, you know, we tried to make that as that feel as right as possible. Every restaurant is like, a, you know, walking distance from where that apartment is supposed to be, and it was the texture of it feeling authentic, the fabric of the neighborhood was important to me. I agree. Uh, do we have microphones or? Yes. Uh, yes? Right there. Thank you. Thank you to all of you and kudos to Howard Parr for the score, but my, my question has to do about the beautiful script that you have written. And I'd like to know the process, how long it took you, how you got to this point of almost perfection. 
Almost perfection. <laughs> perfection. <laughs> no, I was like, what's the thing that I messed up? Which is it? No. Thank you so much. That's so sweet. Um, the script took a really long time, and every time I've written an original screenplay that was worthy, it takes me two years to write the script. And then usually at the end of that two years, it still has some problems, usually with length. Like the first draft was 200 pages or 195 pages or something embarrassing. And then I have to sort of chip away at it to make it have proper shape that's like a movie. So I always feel like I have to write something that's almost novelistic. And then I have to adapt my own novelistic thing and so it can fit inside of a narrative film. Um, so I, I don't know, writing's really hard for me. I, it, I, this is the first movie that I wrote where I actually had a room of one's own, as Virginia Woolf would say, which was very exciting. I live in a two-bedroom apartment with my husband, and um, I, I, I used, the second bedroom used to be mine, and now I have a kid, so I can't have that bedroom anymore. And I had to rent a space on Christie Street for the first time in my life. To actually have a space outside the home to write is very different. Because you can't drift from the desk to, oh, I should do the dishes. Or, oh my god, I have to, you know, I should run out and get milk. Like, there's a weird split to, like, really remove yourself from the domestic realm to write. I don't know, that was very important to me, and it was just different. And I was very disciplined about it, because I had a kid, and I would drop my daughter off at school. Plus, I was paying rent, which is a great incentive to work because I was so freaked out that I was spending money on renting an office that I better use it every day. And so I dropped my daughter off at school, then I walked to this office on Christie Street, and I sat there like banker's hours, and then I'd go home and make dinner. But I just, so anyway, it was very, it was a very disciplined process. And, it, and, and, and I mean, I guess I was disciplined before, but it was just kind of different. It wasn't as organized. And there was something about having those organized hours that really helped. And um, I don't know, that thing about showing up at your desk every day that everybody talks about with regards to writing is very important. And I really felt like if I wasn't sitting at that desk, the things would fly by and I wouldn't be able to catch them, like balls, like, you know, with my mitt. And if I didn't have my mitt on, I wouldn't catch these, you know, free-flying ideas. So anyway, that's sort of, it's hard to talk about writing without being really boring and napping and all the things that you end up doing, but that's sort of a, answer. That sounds so like the wild, artistic, crazy life you can have in this village. <laughs> yeah, it's, it doesn't sound very creative. It, it's not like up all night in my garret with my booze or, yeah, it's really boring. It was like banker's hours, drop kid off at school, go go to Whole Foods, pick up milk, go home. Uh, there's someone right here and the microphone is coming to you, so it's coming behind you. No, the script question. I love the movie. Um, part two, I guess, of his question was: um, with the act, was was there input from the actors, and how much did it change from being on the page to the screen? It did not change. It did not change. Mm -hmm. I mean, I remember Paul change. Giamatti saying when he got the part, and when we were first all together. I think maybe just me and Catherine and Paul at that yeah. point. He said, "Is this one of those movies where like?" we improvise, and the suggestion was that that was happening a lot to him. It was a kind of, I don't know, post-Judd Apatow moment? I don't know. <laughs> because he does that, and I said, no, there will be no improvising whatsoever, because I wrote this fucking thing. And I'm gonna say all these words, because um, there was a lot of time spent. I mean, you know, of course there's improvised behavior and like a bazillion things, but not much in, not, not much in the language department. No, it's and pretty, it, you know, we, there was a huge, kind of sigh of relief by both of us on that couch when you said that. And I think we both were like, oh yeah, because she's Miss Improviser. I'm yeah. so she. Yeah, but it felt, didn't it feel like, it did feel kind of because all we had, because there was some, a, a huge relief and then all we had to worry about was doing justice to this gorgeous piece of writing in front of us and all we needed was in this beautiful piece of writing. Um, and that there was so much uh, freedom in that, and, and release in just worrying about what was in in front of us, and that's all we needed. If and anything, I felt like I had to get out of my own way with it. There was a day, there's a really long chunk of text 
and Tamara's words are so specific and I wanted it to be right. And we walked around that block while they were setting up cameras for about 20 minutes. And I just said that piece of text over and over again to you till there was about no inflection at all, until it was in yeah, it was my this, phone marrow. Yeah, I, I mean, that. that was incredible. And it was really freeing as an actor to have a piece of writing that good that you don't have to do anything with for it to sing. And Tamara's so creative. I've never worked with a, a writer director before who does this, but there was one moment where Catherine and I were standing around this piano. We were not shooting, we were just catching up about we're both moms, talking about our kids. And Tamara saw us talking, and there was like a kid at the piano who's like, My and Tamara was like, I want to shoot this, this is perfect. Bring the cameras over. I've never worked with anybody who does that. It was the most creative artsy. And I remember saying to Catherine, I was like, this is so cool. This was like, my dream when I was in drama school, to, like how people would make movies. And you're incredible, Tamara. Well, I also had this incredible cinematographer who was his own camera operator and did a lot of handheld camera work and was very game for all that sort of stuff. It wasn't like this, oh, we gotta get so-and-so at it. We could, we could pick up things all the time. That's Christos Fedoras. Christos. I mean, this is the thing, uh, I mean, this is a little tangent, but the thing that we had always talked about, Tam, Tam and I and Paul, Paul had always brought this up, that this was, there's something about this, this movie that isn't even about a, a baby, you know, it's, it's so much more an existential <laughs> movie that it ultimately, like, the thing, even when I remember reading this for the first time, like, I couldn't even picture a baby in, in my mind. You know, it's about this baby project, but it's hard to even imagine that baby. Like, I couldn't picture a crib, but, like, I couldn't picture a diaper. It's not like I saw, like, a, you know, like a thing of baby powder. Like, it's like I, I, you see, there's this quest that they're on together, but it really is, like, about this marriage. And Paul had said at some point to Tamara during it, like, this isn't about a baby. This is waiting for Godot. And it really, it's so true. Like, it's really about this, it's like, it's so much more existential existential about this this couple this having this like co like you described it like a co midlife crisis like that are just all these frozen and amber dreams that they had all of you know in their 20s and 30s are all of a sudden they're just like look you know looking at them waking up and you know they're in their 40s and oh, what do you all of a sudden what do you what do you do what happens with this next chapter um uh, so I don't know, that's a tangent, but that's also something that is really kind of moving about this whole, this whole, what, what I wanted in on so badly is that what Tamara had always said, it's about this marriage, almost more so than the baby project. Yeah. I mean, I love the part where you say, I'm, I'm 47, I will be here in two years. Yeah. And you feel like, oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there was someone here? And the microphone is coming. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you about sort of how you structured the family in this film because it's not really a, a conventional family as we're used to seeing. You know, you've got a, you've got a step relationship, and then you've got you know brothers. So it's just like, you know usually in movies, just like oh, so and so are siblings. We know how siblings interact with each other with a few variations. But in this instance, like, how did you decide to structure the family and, um, with with the, the various and sundry relationships? And then also, like, when we have the Thanksgiving scenes, there's this whole seat, this whole extended family that we just see them in those two scenes, but it feels completely real and lived in. And I just sort of like, but as you were as you were developing the film, where where did the idea for how to structure the family? Well, one thing was absolutely necessary, that whoever Sadie was could not be a blood relative. <laughs> that was built into the assignment, that she had to be a, a step something, or else it would be like the social worker says, otherwise it would be incest. So I was like, hmm. Um, and so that was sort of a, that was a built-in thing. I mean, it's interesting, because the movie starts like on such a, just the two of them, and then it kind of blooms out, and, the, and it's, the impact of their their decisions on an entire family and it sort of it expands. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think that that detail like set the precedent. I mean, set the 
thing in motion that she needed to be a step person. I mean, I don't know, my life is filled with steps and um, people by, you know, in law, I mean, I don't know, it's all cobbled together in law, and so it's something familiar. Um, I don't know, I love doing the Thanksgiving thing. I mean, it was, we were so in that little apartment for so long, that apartment we shot for 12 days of a 30 day shoot or something like that. Um, and we did everything there first, and then we moved into what was Molly's house, and suddenly, I was like, oh my god, I've been doing like a two-person play, then it was like a two-person play, then it was a, a three-hander, and suddenly there were all these people there, and I was like, shit, there's all these other characters that we have to, I kind of had forgotten, we had gotten so micro. Yeah. Um, uh, but I don't know if I'm answering your question, but that. Yeah. We, we love the answer. So okay. <laughs> I think we have to wrap it up. We have another screen coming in. And you're coming back anyway in a few hours. Yeah, six yeah. o'clock. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey You Guys. Is yeah. that from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You Guys.